Chapter 19 of Edison, His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Kevin Meneer. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. Chapter 19, Magnetic or Milling Work. During the Hudson Fulton celebration of October 1909, Burgomaster von Leeuwen of Amsterdam, member of the delegation sent officially from Holland to escort the Half Moon and participate in the functions of the anniversary, paid a visit to the Edison Laboratory at Orange to see the inventor, who may be regarded as preeminent among those of Dutch descent in this country. Found, as usual, hard at work, this time on his cement house, of which he showed the iron molds, Edison took occasion to remark that if he had achieved anything worth while, it was due to the obstinacy and pertinacity he had inherited from his forefathers. To which it may be added that not less equally have the nature of inheritance and the quality of atavism been exhibited in his extraordinary predilection for the miller's art. While those Batavian ancestors on the low shores of the Zweder Zee devoted their energies to grinding grain, he has been not less assiduous than they in reducing the rocks of the earth itself to flour. Although this phase of Mr. Edison's diverse activities is not as generally known to the world as many others of a more popular character, the milling of low-grade auriferous ores and the magnetic separation of iron ores have been subjects of engrossing interest and study to him for many years. Indeed, this comparatively unknown enterprise of separating magnetically and putting into commercial form low-grade iron ore, as carried on at Edison, New Jersey, proved to be the most colossal experiment that he has ever made. If a person qualified to judge were asked to answer categorically as to whether or not the enterprise was a failure, he could truthfully answer both yes and no. Yes, in that circumstances over which Mr. Edison had no control compelled the shutting down of the plant at the very moment of success. And no, in that the mechanically successful and commercially practical results obtained after the exercise of stupendous efforts and the expenditure of a fortune are so conclusive that they must inevitably be the reliance of many future iron masters. In other words, Mr. Edison was at least a quarter of a century ahead of the times in the work now to be considered. Before proceeding to the specific description of this remarkable enterprise, however, let us glance at an early experiment in separating magnetic iron sands on the Atlantic seashore. Some years ago I heard one day that down in Quag Long Island there were immense deposits of black magnetic sand. This would be very valuable if the iron could be separated from the sand, so I went to Quag with one of my assistants and saw there for miles large beds of black sand on the beach in layers from one to six inches thick, hundreds of thousands of tons. My first thought was that it would be a very easy matter to concentrate this, and I found I could sell the stuff at a good price. I put up a small plant, but just as I got started, a tremendous storm came up, and every bit of that black sand went out to sea. During the twenty-eight years that have intervened, it has never come back. This incident was really the prelude to the development set forth in this chapter. In the early 80s, Edison became familiar with the fact that the eastern steel trade was suffering a disastrous change, and that business was slowly drifting westward, chiefly by reason of the discovery and opening of enormous deposits of high-grade iron ore in the upper peninsula of Michigan. This ore could be excavated very cheaply by means of improved mining facilities and transported at low cost to lake ports. Hence, the iron and steel mills east of the Alleghenies compelled to rely on limited local deposits of Bessemer ore and upon foreign ores which were constantly rising in value, began to sustain a serious competition with western mills, even in eastern markets. Long before this situation arose, it had been recognized by eastern ironmasters that sooner or later the deposits of high-grade ore would be exhausted, and, in consequence, there would ensue a compelling necessity to fall back on the low-grade magnetic ores. For many years it had been a much discussed question how to make these ores available for transportation to distant furnaces, to pay railroad charges on ores carrying perhaps 80 to 90 percent of useless material would be prohibitive, hence the elimination of the worthless gang, by concentration of the iron particles associated with it, seemed to be the only solution of the problem. Many attempts had been made in bygone days to concentrate the iron in such ores by water processes, but with only a partial degree of success. The impossibility of obtaining a uniform concentrate was a most serious objection, had there not indeed been other difficulties which rendered this method commercially impracticable. It is quite natural, therefore, that the idea of magnetic separation should have occurred to many inventors. 
Thus we find numerous instances throughout the last century of experiments along this line, and particularly in the last 40 or 50 years, during which various attempts have been made by others than Edison to perfect magnetic separation and bring it up to something like commercial practice. At the time, he took up the matter. However, no one seems to have realized the full meaning of the tremendous problems involved. From 1880 to 1885, while still very busy in the development of his electric light system, Edison found opportunity to plan crushing and separating machinery. His first patent on the subject was applied for and issued early in 1880. He decided, after mature deliberation, that the magnetic separation of low-grade ores on a colossal scale at low cost was the only practical way of supplying the furnace man with high quality of iron ore. It was his opinion that it was cheaper to quarry and concentrate lean ore in a big way than to attempt to mine, under adverse circumstances, limited bodies of high-grade ore. He appreciated fully the serious nature of the gigantic questions involved, and his plans were laid out with a view to exercising the utmost economy in design and operation of the plant, in which he contemplated the automatic handling of many thousands of tons of material daily. It may be stated as broadly true that Edison engineered to handle immense masses of stuff automatically, while his predecessors aimed chiefly at close separation. Reduced to its barest, crudest terms, the proposition of magnetic separation is simplicity itself. A piece of the ore, magnetite, may be reduced to powder and the ore particles separated therefrom by the help of a simple hand magnet. To elucidate the basic principle of Edison's method, let the crushed ore fall in thin stream past such a magnet. The magnetic particles are attracted out of the straight line of the falling stream, and being heavy, gravitate inwardly and fall to one side of a partition placed below. The non-magnetic gang descends in a straight line to the other side of the partition. Thus a complete separation is effected. Simple though the principle appears, it was in its application to vast masses of material and in the solving of great engineering problems connected therewith that Edison's originality made itself manifest in the concentrating works that he established in New Jersey early in the 90s. Not only did he develop thoroughly the refining of the crushed ore so that after it had passed the 480 magnets in the mill, the concentrates came out finally containing 91 to 93 percent of the iron oxide, but he also devised collateral machinery, methods and processes all fundamental in their nature. These are too numerous to specify in detail, as they extended throughout the various ramifications of the plant, but the principal ones are worthy of mention, such as the giant rolls for crushing, intermediate rolls, three high rolls, giant cranes, 215 feet long span, vertical dryer, belt conveyors, air separation, mechanical separation of phosphorus, and briquetting. That Mr. Edison's work was appreciated at the time is made evident by the following extract from an article describing the Edison plant, published in the Iron Age of October 28, 1897, in which, after mentioning his struggle with adverse conditions, it says, There is very little that is showy from the popular point of view in the gigantic work which Mr. Edison has done during these years, but to those who are capable of grasping the difficulties encountered, Mr. Edison appears in the new light of a brilliant constructing engineer, grappling with technical and commercial problems of the highest order. His genius as an inventor is revealed in many details of the great concentrating plant, but to our mind, originality of the highest type as constructor and designer appears in bold ways in which he sweeps aside accepted practices in this particular field and attains results not hitherto approached. He pursues methods in ore dressing at which those who are trained in the usual practice may well stand aghast. But considering the special features of the problem to be solved, his methods will be accepted as those economically wise and expedient. A cursory glance at these problems will reveal their import. Mountains must be reduced to dust. All this dust must be handled in detail, so to speak, and from it must be separated the fine particles of iron constituting only one-fourth or one-fifth of its mass and then this iron ore must be put into such shape that it could be commercially shipped and used. One of the most interesting and striking investigations made by Edison in this connection is worthy of note, and may be related in his own words. I felt certain that there must be large bodies of magnetite in the east, which, if crushed and concentrated, would satisfy the needs of the eastern furnaces for steel making. Having determined to investigate the mountain regions of New Jersey, I constructed a very sensitive magnetic needle, which would dip toward the earth if brought over any considerable body of magnetic ore. One of my laboratory assistants went out with me and visited many of the mines of New Jersey, but did not find deposits of any magnitude. One day, however, as we drove over a mountain range, not known as iron-bearing land, I was astonished to find that the needle was strongly attracted and remained so. 
thus indicating that the whole mountain was underlaid with vast bodies of magnetic ore. I knew it was a commercial problem to produce high-grade Bessemer ore from these deposits, and took steps to acquire a large amount of the property. I also planned a great magnetic survey of the East, and I believe it remains the most comprehensive of its kind yet performed. I had a number of men survey a strip reaching from Lower Canada to North Carolina. The only instrument we used was the special magnetic needle. We started in Lower Canada and traveled across the line of March 25 miles, then advanced south 1,000 feet, then back across the line of March again 25 miles, then south another 1,000 feet, across again, and so on. Thus we advanced all the way to North Carolina, carrying our cross-country march from 2 to 25 miles, according to geological formation. Our magnetic needle indicated the presence and richness of the invisible deposits of magnetic ore. We kept minute records of these indications, and when the survey was finished, we had exact information of the deposits in every part of each state we had passed through. We also knew the width, length, and approximate depth of every one of these deposits, which were enormous. The amount of ore disclosed by this survey was simply fabulous. How much so may be judged from the fact that in 3,000 acres immediately surrounding the mills that I afterward established at Edison were over 2 billion tons of low-grade ore. I also secured 16,000 acres in which the deposit was proportionately as large. These few acres alone contained sufficient ore to supply the whole United States iron trade, including exports, for 70 years. Given a mountain of rock containing only one-fifth to one-fourth magnetic iron, the broad problem confronting Edison resolved itself into three distinct parts. First, to tear down the mountain bodily and grind it to powder. Second, to extract from this powder the articles of iron mingled in its mass. And third, to accomplish these results at a cost sufficiently low to give the product a commercial value. Edison realized from the start that the true solution of this problem lay in the continuous treatment of the material, with the maximum employment of natural forces and the minimal of manual labor and generated power. Hence, all his conceptions followed this general principle so faithfully and completely that we find in the plant embodying his ideas the forces of momentum and gravity steadily in harness and keeping the traces taut, while there was no touch of the human hand upon the material from the beginning of the treatment to its finish the staff being employed mainly to keep watch on the correct working of various processes. It is hardly necessary to devote space to the beginnings of the enterprise, although they are full of interest. They served, however, to convince Edison that if he ever expected to carry out his schemes on the extensive scale planned, he could not depend upon the market to supply suitable machinery for important operations, but would be obliged to devise and build it himself. Thus, outside the steam shovel and such staple items as engines, boilers, dynamos, and motors, all of the diverse and complex machinery of the entire concentrating plant, as subsequently completed, was devised by him especially for this purpose. The necessity for this was due to the mainly radical variations made from accepted methods. No such departure was as radical as that of the method of crushing the ore. Existing machinery for this purpose had been designed on the basis of mining methods then in vogue by which the rock was thoroughly shattered by means of high explosives and reduced to pieces of 100 pounds or less. These pieces were then crushed by power directly applied. If a concentrating mill planned to treat five or 6,000 tons per day were to be operated on the basis the investment in crushers and the supply of power would be enormous, to say nothing of the risk of frequent breakdowns by reason of multiplicity of machinery and parts. From a consideration of these facts, and with his usual tendency to upset traditional observances, Edison conceived the bold idea of constructing gigantic rolls which, by the force of momentum, would be capable of crushing individual rocks of vastly greater size than ever before attempted. He reasoned that the advantages thus obtained would be fourfold, a minimum of machinery and parts, greater compactness, a saving of power, and greater economy in mining. As this last-named operation precedes the crushing, let us first consider it as it was projected and carried on by him. Perhaps quarrying would have been a better term than mining in this case, as Edison's plan was to approach the rock and tear it down bodily. The faith that moves mountains had a new opportunity. In work of this nature it had been customary, as above stated, to depend upon a high explosive such as dynamite to shatter and break the ore into lumps of 100 pounds or less. This, however, he deemed to be a most uneconomical process. For energy stored as heat units in dynamite at $260 per ton was more expensive than that of calories in a ton of coal at $3 per ton. Hence he believed that only the minimum of work should be done with a costly explosive, and therefore planned to use dynamite merely to dislodge great masses of rock, 
and depended upon the steam shovel operated by coal under the boiler to displace, handle, and remove the rock in detail. This was the plan that was subsequently put into practice in the great works at Edison, New Jersey. A series of three inch holes 20 feet deep were drilled eight feet apart about 12 feet back of the ore bank, and into these were inserted dynamite cartridges. The blast would dislodge 30 to 35,000 tons of rock, which was scooped up by great steam shovels and loaded onto skips carried by a line of cars on a narrow gauge railroad running to and from the crushing mill. Here the material was automatically delivered to giant rolls. The problem included handling and crushing the run of the mine without selection. The steam shovel did not discriminate, but picked up handily single pieces weighing five or six tons and loaded them on the skips with quantities of smaller lumps. When the skips arrived at the giant rolls, their contents were dumped automatically into a superimposed hopper. The rolls were well named, for with ear-splitting noise they broke up in a few seconds the great pieces of rock tossed in from the skips. It is not easy to appreciate to the full the daring exemplified in these great crushing rolls, or rather rock crackers, without having watched them in operation delivering their solar plexus blows. It was only as one might stand in their vicinity and hear the thunderous roar accompanying the smashing and rending of the rocks as they disappeared from the view that the mind was overwhelmed with a sense of the magnificent proportions of this operation. The enormous force exerted during this process may be illustrated from the fact that during its development, in running one of the early forms of rolls, pieces of rock weighing more than a half ton would be shot up in the air to a height of 20 or 25 feet. The giant rolls were two solid cylinders, six feet in diameter and five feet long, made out of cast iron. To the faces of these rolls were bolted a series of heavy, chilled iron plates containing a number of projecting knobs two inches high. Each row had also two rows of four-inch knobs intended to strike a series of hammer-like blows. The rolls were set face to face 14 inches apart in a heavy frame, and the total weight was 130 tons, of which 70 tons were in moving parts. The space between these two rolls allowed pieces of rock measuring less than 14 inches to descend to other smaller rolls placed below. The giant rolls were belt-driven, in opposite directions through friction clutches, although the belt was not depended upon for the actual crushing. Previous to the dumping of a skip, the rolls were speeded up to a circumferential velocity of nearly a mile a minute, thus imparting to them the terrific momentum that would break up easily in a few seconds boulders weighing five or six tons each. It was as though a rock of this size had got in the way of two express trains traveling in opposite directions at nearly 60 miles an hour. In other words, it was the kinetic energy of the rolls that crumbled up the rocks with pile driver effect. This sudden strain might have tended to stop the engine driving the rolls, but by ingenious clutch arrangement, the belt was released at the moment of resistance in the rolls by reason of the rocks falling between them. The act of breaking and crushing would naturally decrease the tremendous momentum, but after the rock was reduced and the pieces had passed through, the belt would again come into play and once more speed up the rolls for a repetition of their regular prize fighter duty. On leaving the giant rolls, the rocks, having been reduced to pieces not larger than 14 inches, passed into the series of intermediate rolls of similar construction and operation, by which they were still further reduced, and again passed on to three other sets of rolls of smaller dimensions. These latter rolls were also face-lined with chilled iron plates, but unlike the larger ones were positively driven, reducing the rock to pieces of about one half inch size or smaller. The whole crushing operation of reduction from massive boulders to small pebbly pieces having been done in less time than the telling has occupied. The product was conveyed to the dryer, a tower nine feet square and fifty feet high, heated from below by great open furnace fires. All down the inside walls of this tower were placed cast iron plates, nine feet long and seven inches wide, arranged alternately in fish ladder fashion. The crushed rock being delivered at the top would fall down from plate to plate, constantly exposing different surfaces to the heat, until it landed completely dried in the lower portion of the tower, where it fell into conveyors which took it up to the stockhouse. This method of drying was original with Edison. At the time this adjunct to the plant was required. The best dryer on the market was of a rotary type which had a capacity of only 20 tons per hour, with the expenditure of considerable power. As Edison had determined upon treating 250 tons or more per hour, he decided to devise an entirely new type of great capacity, requiring a minimum of power for elevating the material, and depending upon the force of gravity for handling it during the drying process. A long series of experiments resulted in the invention of the tower dryer with capacity of 300 tons per hour.
the rock, broken up into pieces about the size of marbles, having been dried and conveyed to the stockhouse, the surplusage was automatically carried out from the other end of the stockhouse by conveyors to pass through the next process, by which it was reduced to a powder. The machinery for accomplishing this result represented another interesting and radical departure of Edison from accepted usage. He had investigated all the crushing machines in the market and tried all he could get. He found them all greatly lacking in economy of operation. Indeed, the highest results obtainable from the best were 18% of actual work involving a loss of 82% by friction. His nature revolted at such an immense loss of power, especially as he proposed the crushing of vast quantities of ore. Thus he was obliged to begin again at the foundation, and he devised a crushing machine which has subsequently been named the Three High Rolls and which practically reversed the above figures as it developed 84% of work done with only 16% loss in friction. A brief description of this remarkable machine will probably interest the reader. In the two end pieces of a heavy iron frame were set three rolls or cylinders, one in the center, another below, and the other above, all three being in a vertical line. These rolls were of a cast iron three feet in diameter, having chilled iron smooth face plates of considerable thickness. The lowest roll was set in a fixed bearing at the bottom of the frame, and therefore could only turn around on its axis. The middle and top rolls were free to move up or down from and toward the lower roll, and the shafts of the middle and upper rolls were set in a loose bearing which could slip up and down in the iron frame. It will be apparent, therefore, that any material which passed in between the top and the middle rolls and the middle and the bottom rolls would be ground as fine as might be desired, depending entirely upon the amount of pressure applied to the loose rolls. In operation, the material passed first through the upper and middle rolls, and then between the middle and lowest rolls. This pressure was applied in a most ingenious manner. On the ends of the shafts of the bottom and top rolls were syndrical sleeves or bearings having seven sheaves, in which was run a half-inch endless wire rope. This rope was wound seven times over the sheaves as above, and led upward over a single groove sheave, which operated by the piston of an air cylinder, and in this manner the pressure was applied to the rolls. It will be seen, therefore, that the system consisted in a single rope passed over sheaves and so arranged that it could be varied in length, thus providing for elasticity in exerting pressures and regulating it as desired. The efficiency of this system was incomparably greater than that of any other known crusher or grinder. For a while, a pressure of 125,000 pounds could be exerted by these rolls. Friction was almost entirely eliminated because of the upper and lower roll bearings turned with the rolls and revolved in the wire rope, which constituted the bearing proper. The same cautious foresight exercised by Edison in providing a safety device, the fuse, to prevent fires in his electric light system was again displayed in this concentrating plant, where, to save possible injury to its expensive operating parts, he devised an analogous factor, providing all the crushing machinery with closely calculated safety pins, which on being overloaded would shear off and thus stop the machinery at once. The rocks, having thus been reduced to fine powder, the mass was ready for screening on its way to the magnetic separators. Here again, Edison reversed prior practice by discarding rotary screens and devising a form of tower screen, which besides having a very large working capacity by gravity, eliminated all power except that required to elevate the material. The screening process allowed the finest part of the crushed rock to pass on, by conveyor belts, to the magnetic separators, while the coarser particles were in like manner automatically returned to the rolls for further reduction. In a narrative not intended to be strictly technical, it would probably tire the reader to follow this material in detail through the numerous steps attending the magnetic separation. These may be seen in a diagram reproduced from the above-named article in the Iron Age and supplemented by the following extract from the Electrical Engineer, New York, October 28, 1897. At the start of the weakest magnet at the top frees the purest particles and the second takes care of the others but the third catches those to which rock adheres and will extract particles of which only one-eighth is iron. This batch of material goes back for another crushing, so that everything is subjected to an equality of refining. We are now in sight of the real concentrates, which are conveyed to dryer number two for drying again, and are then delivered to the 50 mesh screens. Whatever is fine enough goes through to the eighth-inch magnets, and the remainder goes back for re-crushing. Below the eighth-inch magnets, the dust is blown out of the particles mechanically, and they go to the 4-inch magnets for final cleansing and separation. Obviously, at each step, the percentage of felspar and phosphorus is less and less until in the final concentrates the percentage of iron oxide is 91 to 93 percent. As intimated at the outset, the tailings will be 75 percent of the rock taken from the veins of ore so that every 4 tons of crude, raw, 
low-grade ore will have yielded roughly one ton of high-grade concentrate and three tons of sand, the latter also having its value in various ways. This sand was transported automatically by belt conveyors to the rear of the works to be stored and sold. Being sharp crystalline and even in quality, it was a valuable byproduct. Finding a ready sale for building purposes, railway sandboxes, and various industrial uses. The concentrate in fine powdery form was delivered in similar manner to a stockhouse. As to the next step in the process, we may now quote again from the article in the Iron Age. While Mr. Edison and his associates were working on the problem of cheap concentration of iron ore, an added difficulty faced them in the preparation of the concentrates for the market. Furnace men object to more than a very small proportion of fine ore in their mixtures, particularly when the ore is magnetic, not easily reduced. The problem to be solved was to market an agglomerated material so as to avoid the drawbacks of fine ore. The agglomerated product must be so porous as to afford access of the furnace reducing gases to the ore. It must be hard enough to bear transportation and to carry the furnace burden without crumbling to pieces. It must be waterproof to a certain extent because considerations connected with securing low rates of freight make it necessary to be able to ship the concentrates and market in open coal cars exposed to snow and rain. In many respects, the attainment of these somewhat conflicting ends was the most perplexing of the problems which confronted Mr. Edison, the agglomeration of the concentrates having been decided upon. Two other considerations not mentioned above were of primary importance. First, to find a suitable cheap binding material, and second, its nature must be such that very little would be necessary per ton of concentrates. These severe requirements were staggering, but Mr. Edison's courage did not falter. Although it seemed a well-nigh hopeless task, he entered upon the investigation with his usual optimism and vim. After many months of unremitting toil and research, and the trial of thousands of experiments, the goal was reached in the completion of a successful formula for agglomerating the fine ore and pressing it into briquettes by special machinery. This was the final process requisite for the making of a completed commercial product. Its practice, of course, necessitated the addition of an entirely new department of the works, which was carried into effect by the construction and the installation of the novel mixing and briquetting machinery, together with extensions of the conveyors with which the plant had already been liberally provided. Briefly described, the process consisted in mixing the concentrates with a special binding material in machines of an entirely new type, and in passing the resultant pasty mass into briquetting machines, where it was pressed into cylindrical cakes three inches in diameter and one and a half inches thick, under successive pressures of 78,000, 14,000, and 60,000 pounds. Each machine made these briquettes at the rate of 60 per minute and dropped them into bucket conveyors by which they were carried into drying furnaces through which they made five loops and were delivered to cross conveyors which carried them into the stockhouse. At the end of this process, the briquettes were so hard that they would not break or crumble in loading on the cars or in transportation by rail, while they were so porous as to be capable of absorbing 26% of their own volume in alcohol, but repelling water absolutely perfect, old soaks. Thus, with never-failing persistence and patience, coupled with intense thought and hard work, Edison met and conquered one by one the complex difficulties that confronted him. He succeeded in what he set out to do, and it is now to be noted that the product he had striven so sedulously to obtain was a highly commercial one, for not only did the briquettes of concentrated ore fulfill the purpose of their creation, but in use actually tended to increase the working capacity of the furnace. As the following test, quoted from the Iron Age, October 28, 1897, will attest. The only trial of any magnitude of the briquettes in the blast furnace was carried through earlier this year in the Crane Iron Works, Catasauqua, Pennsylvania, by Leonard Peckett. The furnace at which the test was made produces from 100 to 110 tons per day when running on the ordinary mixture. The charging of briquettes was begun with a percentage of 25% and was carried up to 100%. The following is the record of the results. January 5th, working percent 25, quantity of briquette tons 104, silica 2.770, phosphorus 0.830, sulfur 0.018, manganese 0.500. January 6th, working percent 37 and one half, quantity of briquette tons 4 and one half, silica 2.620, phosphorus 0.740. Sulfur, 0 0.018. Manganese, 0 0.350. January 7th, working percent, 50. Quantity of briquette tons, 138 and one half. Ton silica, 2.572. Phosphorus, 0 
sulfur 0 0.015, manganese 0 0.200. January 8th, working percent 75, quantity of briquette tons 119, silica 1.844, phosphorus 0 0.264, sulfur 0 0.022, manganese 0 0.200. January 9th, working percent 100, quantity of briquette tons 138.5, silica 1.712, phosphorus 0 0.147, sulfur 0 0.038, manganese 0 0.185. On the 9th, at 5 p.m., the briquettes having been nearly exhausted, the percentage was dropped to 25%, and on the 10th, the output dropped to 120 tons and on the 11th the furnace had resumed the usual work on the regular standard ores. These figures prove that the yield of the furnace is considerably increased. The crane trial was too short to settle the question to what extent the increase in product may be carried. This increase in output of course means a reduction in the cost of labor and of general expenses. The richness of the ore and its purity of course affect the limestone consumption. In the case of the crane trial there was a reduction from 30 percent to 12 percent of the ore charge. Finally, the fuel consumption is reduced, which in the case of the eastern plants with their relatively costly coke is a very important consideration. It is regarded as possible that eastern furnaces will be able to use a smaller proportion of the costlier coke and correspondingly increase in anthracite coal, which is a cheaper fuel in that section. So far as foundry iron is concerned, the experience at Catasauqua, Pennsylvania, brief as it has been, shows that a stronger and tougher metal is made. Edison himself tells an interesting little story in this connection when he enjoyed the active help of that noble character, John Fritz, the distinguished inventor and pioneer of the modern steel industry in America. He says, When I was struggling along with the iron ore concentration, I went to see several blast furnace men to sell the ore at the marketplace. They saw I was very anxious to sell it, and they would take advantage of my necessity. But I happened to go to Mr. John Fritz of Bethlehem Steel Company and told him what I was doing. Well, he said to me, Edison, you are doing a good thing for the eastern furnaces. They ought to help you, for it will help us out. I am willing to help you. I mix a little sentiment with business, and I will give you an order for 100,000 tons. And he sat right down and gave me the order. The Edison concentrating plant has been sketched in the briefest outline with the view of affording merely a bare idea of the great work of its projector. To tell the whole story in detail and show its logical sequence step by step would take a little less than a volume in itself. For Edison's method, always iconoclastic when progress is in sight, were particularly so at the period in question. It has been said that Edison's scrap heap contains the elements of a liberal education, and this was essentially true for the discard during the ore milling experience. Interesting as it might be to follow at length the numerous phases of ingenious and resourceful development that took place during those busy years, the limit of present space forbids their relation. It would, however, be denying the justice that is Edison's due to omit all mention of two hitherto unnamed items in particular that have added to the world's store of useful devices. We refer first to the great traveling hoisting crane having a span of 250 feet and used for hoisting loads equal to 10 tons, this being the largest of the kind made up to that time, and afterward used as a model by many others. The second item was the ingenious and varied forms of conveyor belt devised and used by Edison at the concentrating works, and subsequently developed into a separate and extensive business by an engineer to whom he gave permission to use his plans and patterns. Edison's native shrewdness and knowledge of human nature was put to practical use in the busy days of plant construction. It was found impossible to keep mechanics on account of indifferent residential accommodations afforded by the tiny village, remote from civilization among the central mountains of New Jersey. This puzzling question, much discussed between him and his associate, Mr. W. S. Mallory, until finally he said to the latter, If we want to keep the men here, we must make it attractive for the women, so let us build some houses that will have running water and electric lights, and rent at low rate. He set to work, and in a day finished a design for a type of house. Fifty were quickly built and fully described in advertising for mechanics. Three days' advertisements brought in over 650 applications, and afterward Edison had no trouble in obtaining all the first-class men he required as settlers in the artificial Yosemite he was creating. We owe to Mr. Mallory a characteristic story of this period as to an incidental unbending from toil, which in itself illustrates the ever-present determination to conquer what is undertaken, 
Along in the latter part of the 90s, when the work on the problem of concentrating iron ore was in progress, it became necessary when leaving the planet Edison to wait over at Lake Hopatcong one hour for a connecting train. During some of these waits, Mr. Edison had seen me play billiards. At the particular time this incident happened, Mrs. Edison and her family were away for the summer, and I was staying at the Glenmont home on the Orange Mountains. One hot Saturday night, after Mr. Edison had looked over the evening papers, he said to me, Do you want to play a game of billiards? Naturally, this astonished me very much, as he is a man who cares little or nothing for the ordinary games, with the single exception of Parcheesi, of which he is very fond. I said I would like to play, so we went up to the billiard room of the house. I took off the cloth, got out the balls, picked out a cue for Mr. Edison, and when we banked for the first shot, I won and started the game. After making two or three shots, I missed, and a long karam shot was left for Mr. Edison, the cue ball and object ball being within about twelve inches of each other, and the other ball a distance of nearly the length of the table. Mr. Edison attempted to make the shot, but missed it, and said, put the balls back. So I put them back in the same position, and he missed it a second time. I continued at his request to put the balls back in the same position for the next fifteen minutes, until he could make the shot every time. Then he said, I don't want to play any more. Having taken a somewhat superficial survey of the great enterprise under consideration, having had a cursory glance at the technical development of the plant up to the point of its successful culmination in the making of a marketable commercial product as exemplified in the test at the crane furnace, let us revert to the demonstration and note the events that followed. The facts of this actual test are far more eloquent than the volumes of argument would be as justification of Edison's assiduous labors over eight years, and of the expenditure of a fortune in bringing his broad conception to a concrete possibility. In the patient solving of tremendous problems, he had toiled up the mountainside of success, scaling its topmost peak and obtaining a view of the boundless prospect. But alas, the best laid plans o' mice and men gang aft agly. The discovery of great deposits of rich Bessemer ore in the Misaba range of mountains in Minnesota a year or two previous to completion of his work had been followed by the opening up of those deposits and marketing of the ore. It was of such rich character that being cheaply mined by greatly improved and inexpensive methods, the market price of crude ore of like iron units fell from about $6.50 to $3.50 per ton at the time when Mr. Edison was ready to supply his concentrated product. At the former price, he could have supplied the market and earned a liberal profit on his investment, but at $3.50 per ton, he was left without a reasonable chance of competition. Thus was swept away the possibility of reaping the reward so richly earned by years of incessant thought, labor, and care. This great and notable plant, representing a very large outlay of money, brought to completion, ready for business, and embracing some of the most brilliant and remarkable of Edison's inventions and methods, must be abandoned by force of circumstances over which he had no control, and with it must die the high hopes that his progressive, conquering march to success had legitimately engendered. The financial aspect of these enterprises is often overlooked and forgotten. In this instance, it was of more than usual import and seriousness, as Edison was virtually his own backer, putting into the company almost the whole of all the fortune his inventions had brought him. There is a tendency to deny the capital that thus takes desperate chances its full reward if things go right, and to insist that it shall have barely the legal rate of interest and far less than the return of over-the-counter retail trade. It is an absolute fact that the great electrical inventors and the men who stood behind them have had little return for their foresight and courage. In this instance, when the inventor was largely his own financier, the difficulties and perils were redoubled. Let Mr. Mallory give an instance. During the latter part of the Panic of 1893, there came a period when we were very hard up for ready cash, due largely to the panicky conditions and a large payroll had been raised with considerable difficulty. A short time before payday, our treasurer called me up by telephone and said, I have just received the paid checks from the bank, and I am fearful that my assistant, who has forged my name to some of the checks, has absconded with about $3,000. I went immediately to Mr. Edison and told him of the forgery and the amount of money taken and in what an embarrassing position we were for the next payroll. When I had finished, he said, It is too bad the money is gone, but I will tell you what to do. Go and see the president of the bank which paid the forged checks. Get him to admit the bank's liability, and then say to him that Mr. Edison does not think the bank should suffer because he happened to have a dishonest clerk in his employ. Also say to him that I shall not ask them to make the amount good. This was done. The bank admitting its liability and being much pleased with this action, when I reported to Mr. Edison, he said, That's all right. We have made a friend of the bank, and we may need friends later on. 
and so it happened that some time afterward, when we greatly needed help in the way of loans, the bank willingly gave us the accommodations we required to tide us over for a critical period. This iron ore concentrating project had lain close to Edison's heart and ambition. Indeed, it had permeated his whole being to the exclusion of almost all other investigations or inventions for a while. For five years he had lived and worked steadily at Edison, leaving there only on Saturday night to spend Sunday at his home in Orange, and returning to the plant by an early train on Monday morning. Life at Edison was of the simple kind, work, meals, and a few hours sleep day by day. The little village, called into existence by the concentrating works, was of the most primitive nature, and offered nothing in the way of frivolity or amusement. Even the scenery is austere. Hence Edison was enabled to follow his natural bent in being surrounded day and night by his responsible chosen associates, with whom he worked uninterrupted by outsiders from early morning away into the late hours of the evening. Those who were laboring with him, inspired by his unflagging enthusiasm, followed his example and devoted all their waking hours to the furtherance of his plans with a zeal that ultimately bore fruit in the practical success here recorded. In view of its present status, this colossal enterprise at Edison may well be likened to the prologue of a play that is subsequently to be enacted for the benefit of future generations. But before ringing down the curtain, it is desirable to preserve the unities by quoting the words of one of the principal actors, Mr. Mallory, who says, The concentrating works had been in operation, and we had produced a considerable quantity of the briquettes, and had been able to sell only a portion of them, the iron market being in such condition that the blast furnaces were not making any new purchases of iron ore, and were having difficulty to receive and consume the ores which had been previously contracted for. So what sales we were able to make were at extremely low prices, my recollection being that they were between $3.50 and $3.80 per ton. Whereas, when the works had started, we had hoped to obtain $6 to $6.50 per ton for the briquettes. We had also thoroughly investigated the wonderful deposit at Misaba, and it was with the greatest possible reluctance that Mr. Edison was able to come finally to the conclusion that, under existing conditions, the concentrating plant could not be made into a commercial success. This decision was reached only after the most careful investigations and calculations, as Mr. Edison was just as full of fight and ambition to make it a success as when he had first started. When this decision was reached, Mr. Edison and I took the Jersey Central train from Edison bound for Orange, and I did not look forward to the immediate future with any degree of confidence, as the concentrating plant was heavily in debt without any early prospect of being able to pay off its indebtedness. On the train, the matter of the future was discussed, and Mr. Edison said that, inasmuch as we had the knowledge gained from our experience in the concentrating problem, we must, if possible, apply it to some practical use, and at the same time we must work out some other plans by which we could make enough money to pay off the concentrating company's indebtedness. Mr. Edison stating most positively that no company with which he had personally been actively connected had ever failed to pay its debts, and he did not propose to have the concentrating company any exception. In the discussion that followed, he had suggested several kinds of work which he had in his mind, and which might prove profitable. We figured carefully over the probabilities of financial returns from the phonograph works and other enterprises, and after discussing many plans, it was finally decided that he would apply the knowledge we had gained in the concentrating plants by building a plant for manufacturing Portland cement, and that Mr. Edison would devote his attention to the developing of a storage battery which did not use lead and sulfuric acids. So these two lines of work were taken up by Mr. Edison with just as much enthusiasm and energy as is usual with him, the commercial failure of the concentrating plant seeming not to affect his spirits in any way. In fact, I have often been impressed strongly with the fact that, during the dark days of the concentrating problem, Mr. Edison's desire was very strong that the creditors of the concentrating work should be paid in full, and only once did I hear him make any reference to the financial loss which he himself made. And he then said, as far as I am concerned, I can any time get a job at $75 per month as a telegrapher, and that will amply take care of all my personal requirements. As he already stated, however, he started in with the maximum amount of enthusiasm and ambition, and in the course of about three years we succeeded in paying off all the indebtedness of the concentrating works, which amounted to several hundred thousand dollars. As to the state of Mr. Edison's mind when the final decision was reached to close down, if he was specially disappointed, there was nothing in his manner to indicate it, his every thought being for the future, and as to what could be done to pull us out of the financial situation in which we found ourselves, and to take advantage of the knowledge which we had acquired at so great a cost. 
It will have been gathered that the funds for this great experiment were furnished largely by Edison. In fact, over two million dollars were spent in the attempt. Edison's philosophic view of affairs is given in the following anecdote from Mr. Mallory. During the boom times of 1902, when the old General Electric stock sold at its high water mark of about $330, Mr. Edison and I were on our way from the cement plant at New Village, New Jersey, to his home at Orange. When we arrived at Dover, New Jersey, we got a New York newspaper, and I called his attention to the quotation of that day on General Electric. Mr. Edison then asked, if I hadn't sold any of mine, what would it be worth today? And after some figuring, I replied, over four million dollars. When Mr. Edison is thinking seriously over a problem, he is in the habit of pulling his right eyebrow, which he did now for 15 or 20 seconds. Then his face lighted up, and he said, well, it's all gone, but we had a hell of a good time spending it with which revelation of an attitude worthy of Mark Tapley himself, this chapter may well conclude. End of chapter 19. Recording by William Kevin Muneer. Las Vegas, Nevada, 2008.